Hi, uh, my name is Jason Kreidner. I'm a board member at the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. And um, uh, BeagleBoard is a nonprofit that makes um, Linux and Zephyr now, um, newly. Um, Zephyr-based um, open hardware platforms, right, that run open source um, software. And um, yeah, um, we certainly love all sorts of other projects like, uh, you know, BSDs and, um, and all the, you know, wonderful um, non-Linux Foundation projects. But we have a special liking for um, the Linux Foundation projects with, um, with Linux and Zephyr, right? So we really appreciate the way this community works together. Um, and um, supports each other um, from hobby, um, self-interest projects, um, you know, projects for other people, all the way to professional product designs. Um, and my experience with the Linux developers is they deeply care about educating the next generation and making sure that we're pre preserving the knowledge base um, for, for people in the future, right, with wonderful tools like Git. Um, that allow us to look at the development history and understand where things come from. I say all that because in this talk, I want to talk a little bit about how we preserve knowledge, right? How do we pass that on? Um, and different ways we could do rapid prototyping and leverage um, software, I think, have a significant impact on that. Um, there is a a scourge on the face of the earth. No, um, there are some habits that I don't think are necessarily healthy um, for um, the open source um, development world. Um, but I want to talk about a number of different approaches, that in some including um, ones that are very effective, but maybe not the best idea. Um, and. Um, and I think that it's also, I want to talk some about the benefits of using both uh, Linux and Zephyr together. I don't have enough time to really talk about making the trade-offs, like going between one or the other, um, but they're both really fantastic projects. Um, how many people use Zephyr already? This is a Zephyr, yeah, okay, oh, wow. Um, so you know how it can make really, really tiny um, images, but yet it's very, very um, capable, right? There's a lot of features, but you don't have to bring in the features that you don't need. Um, but sometimes there's some lift that you can get um, from a, a Linux system in the loop somewhere. Um, and that's some part of what I want to talk about. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to look at specifically these six different uh, kind of mechanisms for rapidly prototyping an IoT um, type of, you know, um, solution. Right, um, you know, Arduino code um, on Zephyr. Um, anybody know that you could run Arduino code on Zephyr? Uh, one, all right, so you can learn something new. Um, MicroPython, probably a lot more of you knew that you could run MicroPython on Zephyr, not so many. Yes, there is a MicroPython port to Zephyr. Um, I think, and I think it's actually a really, you know, um, there are some ports out there that I think are somewhat more complete, but the Zephyr port from MicroPython I think is actually really good. Um, and there's some nice integrations in with Zephyr, um, uh, the Zephyr RTOS as well. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, doing Python user space code, um, but on the Zephyr device, if that probably doesn't make any sense yet. But we're gonna, we're gonna use some Python code um, to control peripherals on a Zephyr device. So you can kind of recommit the same um, atrocities that people do with Python libraries on Linux devices today. Um, and then we'll clean it up a little bit with some, some, some Linux kernel drivers. Um, and we'll talk, um, the, just a, we'll just really just to kind of talk about the native um, the benefits of native Linux drivers and the roadmap towards them. Um, um, how many of you have heard of Graybus? 
Not so many, just a handful. How many of you have heard of Project Aura? The, the defunct mobile phone, modular mobile phone. It's interesting, those weren't all the same people, but it was close. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna go and kind of look at the pros and cons of, of the different approaches. And, you know, I, we make these little boards with software on them that will kind of be my focus, but the, this really doesn't matter that it's these boards. Um, the idea is we've got a microcontroller running Zephyr um, and a, you know, a computer running Linux um, and, you know, some sort of network connection in between them. Um, in our case, it's a um, sub gigahertz wireless network connection. Um, and, you know, just looking at the, the, the why do we want to do that? Um, why do we, what, what's, the, what's the, the idea of why just having a, a, a Linux um, uh, system and why having a Zephyr system um, in there together makes sense? Um, well, Linux nodes, um, you know, are by nature a little more memory hungry. Um, you know, you require, um, you, you can, we know we can strip down Linux to run on, on all sorts of things. Um, but the Linux that we are probably most know and love, um, uh, you know, offers um, a lot of capability to do things remotely, right? To, to use the kernel itself to get visibility to what's going on um, inside the system, right? To do more complicated networking solutions with multiple different types of networking stacks and routing um, and, um, you know, to do a lot of, um, Linux is designed to work for servers, so not necessarily sitting at your desktop as well, right? So yes, it works great on the desktop, um, but it's designed to be used remotely, right? That's how a lot of people do it um, um, every day. Um, you've got shells, very powerful shells you can use, and very, you know, lots of logging capabilities. Um, you know, virtualization, you know, access to, to large storage and network-based storage and a lot of features um, that you'd want. Um, um, but of course, for these data nodes and for a lot of things, you need something low cost, um, you know, and therefore Zephyr makes a really good um, solution for that. Um, and while Zephyr, Zephyr's um, drastically growing in capability very quickly, um, there's probably still some point at which that data is going to touch a Linux server, right? It might not be on premises, it might be in the cloud, um, but I think it's just worth paying attention to um, that Linux to um, sensor node um, with Zephyr platform. I think there's just a lot of work that we can do um, to try to, to, to simplify that experience um, for developers. So it's probably gonna go to Linux anyway. So the work that I'm gonna kind of show, these are the two Git repos. The first one is the, the Zephyr. We've, we have a, I hate to use the word SDK, but it's just a patched version of Zephyr with some kind of a little bit more bleeding edge stuff and a bunch of uh, example projects that are compiled under CI, right? So um, the projects that I have here, um, Either they're building under the CI now, um, or they will be soon, so that you, know, you can easily just kind of pull down those examples and, and, and run them. Um, and then the Linux, we, we were using a, a Debian-based system um, and using a bunch of shell scripts and deb, uh, debootstrapped in order to build the, the, that system, right? But all that customization is stored in those couple of repos and, or the repos that they reference. Yeah, so Arduino for... Um, Zephyr. Um, so last uh, year under Google Summer of Code, um, there was a, um, a Zephyr plus Arduino um, port done. Um, and so they took the, the Arduino core, and so you've got the Arduino library that essentially is, is you know, wraps um, the Zephyr calls, right? So um, you, you map all of the different, um, the, the, the index pin IDs, Right, like you'd have the board IDs on a um, on an Arduino um, into the where you'd have like the GPIO bank and um, index, you know, the chip and index IDs, 
um, in, in Zephyr, right? So they do a mapping, um, therefore you can just call the Arduino functions and reference the pin numbers um, by the single integer index um, or the analog IO index equivalents um, and do you know, GPIO. Um, they also tie into the PWM, um, SPI, UART, um, I2C, um, and ADC subsystems of Zephyr, right? So you can just use the Arduino calls for all those subsystems. Um, the, the build environment, at least as, as, as I've seen it, as it, it's out of this project right now, is, is still the Zephyr build system, right? But you are compiling the wrapped, um, if you're from, how, how many of you have written Arduino code? Yeah, so the, the, the setup and loop structure that you're familiar with, right, um, and the, um, the, the, the header files that you're used to including um, for the different functions, right, are the same. So that code is the same. But when you want to build it, it's not under the Arduino IDE right now. Right now you just do West build and you build it like all the other um, Zephyr projects that you have. It's just now you have a, um, an extra, um, extra sets of code um, in the loop. Um, so this is something, if you're not familiar with Arduino, a lot of people that aren't doing computer science and electrical engineering and embedded systems every day um, are very familiar, so that's a great benefit. Um, so there's a lot of code base out there. Um, but I would argue that's also a really bad reason to use it because there's a lot of people can do it and a lot of people really probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, and you know, this is all example code that nobody does um, like real QA on, right? They just publish it somewhere. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, um, but the nice thing about, that, so, so why is it better on um, Zephyr than just on its own? Um, you know, well, there's not much of a networking stack in Arduino. Um, but we know that there's a really nice networking stack um, in Zephyr. And because it's really just Zephyr, you can make all the calls um, to all the Zephyr functions and you can con do still configure everything with the, the, the def configs, right? You still have full flexibility. But now you can copy and paste um, Arduino libraries um, into your code. Um, and, you know, of course, I think one of the, the, the really nice things that, you know, you've got all this networking stack, but you also have MCU boot and MCU manager, so you can do remote management, you can do firmware over the up air updates um, when you have Zephyr underneath the hood. So it gives people a very familiar programming environment with Arduino, but that, that powerful capability of Zephyr under the hood to do remote updates. So this is what it looks like um, as an example. Right, this, um, I need to, to, to look at that one a little bit more honestly, but um, it, it's, it's, it's not um, perfectly clean yet. I think it's, it was a, a, an intern job over a summer um, with some good mentorship, um, but you're able to go and just take the, the familiar Arduino API and use that and you can um, you know, dump out to the, the UART port um, you know, just as you would expect um, with an Arduino, right? Um, but here you're running Zephyr under the hood. Um, even things like the LEDs, you know, how we, most of our, all our Zephyr projects are required to kind of declare LED zero. It'll grab that as the equivalent of like pin 13 in Arduino for blinking the LED, right? So Blinky just works on Zephyr boards, right? Um, so that's, I think this is, I think this is where I kind of stopped with the, I hope that some of this was good news, I hope. I don't think this is good news, right? So, um, so my, I, I kind of, this, I went back to my original drawing, right? I'm gonna keep solving the same problem six different ways, um, six different kind of programming paradigms to go and solve this, this problem. Um, this is just an OPT 3001 sensor. It's actually built into the board, but I kind of drew it on here anyway to make it look like it was something else. Uh, but um, so I want to talk to that sensor. And so it's like, well, well, how do I do that on Arduino? And, you know, like 
every good engineer, I just Google it. Pause. Um, and, you know, I'm returned a few things. Well, one of these is actually showing up on Arduino website. Sounds good, right? Um, but it's a third party library that seems to just kind of be fetched and dumped on here that hasn't been touched in six years. Um, and that's what you find on the Arduino site to talk to an OPT 3001. For me, this is scary. I don't know if it, how it is for you. Um, but, you know, I had every hope that this would still work, right? This Arduino has been stable and used for so long, right? This should just work, right? Nah, not really. Um, I don't know how much of this is honestly in the, 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 the limitations of the port or the, the code itself, but um, I, I, I never could get the, the, the OPT stuff to run within the, um, you know, even though the wire examples work um, in the Arduino port to Zephyr, um, I could not find a working example just out on the internet of Arduino uh, OPT 13. Um. Yep, I had, uh, anyway, I had a little better, little better luck with, with Python. Um, so the, the, the MicroPython port um, for Zephyr, um, I think, is, is, is really interesting, right? Because you get this um, self-hosted um, uh, read, evaluate, uh, print loop. I think I figured all the, I remembered all the letters. Um, but, you know, the, you, you have, a, like, bring back the basic prompt, right? If anybody's old, nobody's old enough for that except me. Um, <laughs> um, and, but you can actually do live coding, so you've got, you know, some, some, some benefits that you'd have to, you know, from a dynamic system, um, and there's just a lot, a lot of emerging examples coming out for, for, um, uh, Python, regular Python and micro Python to, to go and build on, um, right, this seems to be kind of the new Arduino in a lot of ways. Um, and um, yeah, and of course those benefits that we talked about that um, uh, from Zephyr Arduino getting remote over the air updates, you know, rich networking stacks, right? Um, those come with the Zephyr port for for um, uh, MicroPython as well. Um, so you have socket commands, um, and uh, although the 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 socket wrapper is um, not very complete. Um, the reading of sensors using the I2C interface actually turns out to be pretty easy um, and does work. Um, but the, um, so I can use Python code that reads the OPT3001 sensor and make that work. Um, and I can do um, listening examples, well, that, I'll get into this, um, that work fine and I'll show you that. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm doing an IPv6 um, um, you know, packet transmission for, for the, the, the architecture that I was building here, um, and that did not work um, in the uh, MicroPython port today, right? So you couldn't generate the packet um, template in order to fill it in. Um, and it's just, it, there's just a couple of wrappers that are missing from the port because it, it must not be being used enough for, um, IPv6 socket networking. Um, so we we uh, so so I've got a, a version of MicroPython um, compiled for the the Beagle Connect that I that I publish, um, and you know if we look at how we can use that, there's this really wonderful thing um, that you can actually just leverage the Zephyr sensor drivers, right? So yes, you can do the the MicroPython. Um, uh, and the, the Python um, code to get that to, to read the OPT3001. Um, but I can also just do this little bit of code, ignore the humidity sensor kind of shoved in the middle there, um, but those few lines to go and read the value. Again, I couldn't get it to, um, to transmit the data. Um, oh, did I, I left out the, the one that I wanted. Um, but I could easily get it to receive the, the data from the other ones that are using the just a pure native Zephyr to broadcast um, the packets, right? So the, the IPv6 packet reception um, in MicroPython worked great. Any questions about MicroPython? 
because I'm going to try to drive into the dive into the the gray bus stuff. Right, I think I've got about halfway in my time. MicroPython or our, our Arduino stuff. Is that of interest? To, to, is anybody wanting to do something with those? Or those just seem like too, too much of toys? Okay. And understanding what... Oh, sorry. Tim was talking up front. So the thing about Arduino and uh, MicroPython, CircuitPython, is that it's a very easy on-ramp for very young, new developers. And I'm talking as young as like three to five years old sometimes. There's other things like Scratch and so on. But I think it's important from that perspective that we can have young people on exactly the same hardware and the same thought process, but with a little bit easier lift for the first prop, um, learnings. Absolutely. The, 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 um, cause, like when they're understanding the, the, these wire interfaces to devices for the first time, um, those programming languages give them a fairly simple paradigms for understanding the, the I.O. Um, and, you know, they even have, like, you can have block-based generators um, generating both of those code sets. Um, and people are building, you know, great, like, virtual machines that run on top of them that even abstract things um, more. Um, but I think it's interesting to kind of get this stuff running here so that there's a, a roadmap to move them past that, right, to move them into um, a, a more native OS driver environment. Um, explaining the need for drivers, um, I think, is something interesting. Question. Tom uh, Hanna, Tom Wogemon Holdings. Um, I wanted to emphasize the, again, from my personal experience, the value of systems like the Arduino and the MicroPython. I mean, I'm an electrical engineer. I've been retired for a few years, and before I retired, I was financially done. And before I retired, I had a nasty fight with Massimo Banzi at the conference, basically saying that the Arduino is a toy, and I trained cadets on 8-bit assembly. And while this is true, we should always keep in mind that the low-level entry basically makes electrical engineering accessible to non-traditional EEs. Like, for example, my wife, she's a Java developer. A Java developer doesn't do assembly. But with the Arduino, she was able to automatize half, half of our apartment, for example, without even, just I came back from a trade show and one day I saw, uh, it's automatized. This is the kind of value which especially an electrical engineer often doesn't want to see. And I mean, I'm gonna get hate mail for this from other electrical engineers, but I really think one should keep always this in mind, the non-traditional, non-EE embedded guy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I actually agree with you, so. Um, but I think that we need to understand their place and understand how do we teach people about why we want um, driver models, right? Um, you know, a lot of the other R tosses out there don't really have driver models, so you can't do something like use a single sensor interface to go and read whatever sensor that you might have connected, right? Um, you know, the, those sort of subsystems aren't there, and those um, really can provide a, um, a, a, a a drastic simplification of the the rest of the code, right? For a little bit of of, of headache, um, and ultimately, there's there's one code base, so I, this is not having the problem of wondering about the quality of the random library that I pulled down. I mean, the great thing with all those Python libraries is I can debug them, but God, why would I want to, right? When I know that Zephyr and Linux have debug drivers that just work. Um, and, um, yeah, so. Uh, th just, that's just one, one question for myself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, I agree with the value of MicroPython and Arduino. <clears throat> so because of that value, I wanted to ask if, you know, if you're aware of the current situation in terms of uh, contributions and maintainership for MicroPython, because you've been, uh, the port on Zephyr, the specific port on Zephyr, not the... I don't um, know the details of that. I've seen um, a regular reoccurrence of, of commits, um, right, the, the, that, are, that are coming in and um, and you know, some some fixes. Um, I think a lot of the things that it needs to be kind of first class are not that hard. Um, 
to go and and um, and and fix. Um, I would love to see some people motivated um, because I think it the the it provides a very um, useful gateway into um, operating system based um, programming. One of my fears is that you generate too much um, unknowns, right? I think kids these days, um, you know, when they think of Arduino, they think it, it's like maybe how I grew up thinking about computers. It does exactly what you tell it, right? Because that's how I grew up. A computer always did exactly what you tell it. Um, these days, a lot of your computers don't necessarily do exactly what you tell it because there's too many other people telling it to do different things. And um, the, the one, like the counterbalance to me in some respect of uh, putting in operating systems and putting um, that into these, um, you know, the Arduino and the, the MicroPython programming environments is introduce things, a lot of things that are unfamiliar or unknown um, to the developer. I think that with Zephyr, however, it, it is a reasonably easy to understand code base. And as long, once you get past understanding how the device tree maps and the, you, you get the generated device tree in your output, right? Once you see how the config stuff maps and you get the generated configs, you can, you can figure out exactly what code is generated um, in your output, right? So, um, and, and, and you get the benefit of all the other eyes looking at it. So I think you can generate very predictable systems with tools like Zephyr. I fully agree with you that Zephyr provides the more predictability. I fully agree with you. You are running into open doors. But please, th think of the cadet. Don't think of the situation from a professional electrical engineer's point of view. Think of, basically, think of somebody like my wife. She had access to a full lab for many years. And she was always, no, I've got my Apple. I do my Java. And this is it. And uh, the, the, this person doesn't care about the deterministicness of execution. She doesn't care whether the window blind goes up in 10 or in eight seconds. The, but she will care after she has done the first experiments. Forgive me for being blunt. I see it like an entry-level mm. drug, the Arduino and the MicroPython. It gets the people hooked, and then they, then they automatically move to something different. I, I think where the, term, the determinism really matters is in trusting that, that the, 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 the computer is running the code that, that I've generated for it, right? And, and um, you know, we, we, we often, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people here have generated a assembly from their C code so that they can figure out if the C compiler is actually generating what it's, we thought it was going to generate, right? Um, you know, and, and, and we can do that, right? Um, but uh, you know, bugs in compilers are still there, but they've gone down, right? We, but I think um, where I'm trying to 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 um, to emphasize is I don't want people to to lose that idea. A computer just does what it you tell it, um, right? Pulling the plug because it's doing something funky is not the answer to the future, right? That um, right. I think we need to w be very conscientious of the technical debt that we're building on top of. So, um, so Project Aura. Um, Project Aura was a, um, uh, an attempt to design um, a, a modular um, cell phone. Um, you know, this is a, a different type of technical debt, right? You know, we throw away our cell phones every you know, couple years to try to get another whole platform that we don't have access to and understanding of what's going on inside of. Um, but this was an attempt to, to, to sort of break down the problem a little bit and make each individual module something that you could upgrade or replace or even design and put in, um, uh, in, a, you know, in, in a modular basis on your own. Um, right, with published I.O. standards, things that you can actually go and monitor and look at, and ultimately you could replace individual parts of it with, with, with something um, potentially more open than something else. Um, and um, unfortunately, the project was killed, but the good news is that Graybus, out of the, the, the Project Ara project, is upstream. It's in the Linux kernel. We can leverage it, and we can do some fun and interesting things with it. 
Um, so they had the need to make I squared C and SPI and UART essentially hot pluggable um, because that's what all the little embedded electronics are using. Um, and um, so they needed a way that they could plug in and, and get a new I squared C bus if what they needed to talk to was an I squared C sensor, right? So they just put microcontrollers, the microcontrollers be very, can be very cheap, um, cheaper than the sensors and the memories and the other things that um, you might be interfacing to, um, and make them work together. Um, and um, yep, it's in the mainland kernel, the reference is Unipro, um, but there's been some, you know, we don't, it doesn't have to be, right? Because it's, um, uh, it's just a, a swappable portion in the driver code where you can put essentially any transport you want because now you have packetized uh, raw bus transactions. Um, you can also have high level sensor transactions or, or display transactions um, over gray bus, um, but you can also just have an I squared C read write, SPI read and write, UART reads and writes um, over gray bus. Um, and now you can put them over a network um, like I'm doing here, um, or you can put them across you know, other wired interfaces. Most of this is prototyped um, through USB connections. Um, yeah, so I think we're all familiar with how nicely um, USB works on a computer, right? You plug it in. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it notices you've, you've plugged something in. Um, you know, you add the, the computer asks, what did you plug into me, right? And the thing that you plugged into it tells it what it is. Um, it then loads the driver uh, to match um, what it's talking to, and it works. But that's not so much so in embedded world. Um, you know, in, in our world, right, you connect up over I squared C, then you write some device tree and you recompile and, you know, um, you know, if you're using Linux, you're a little luckier because you can, you just, you know, recompile part of it, but then you still have to reboot because we don't have upstream dynamic device tree overlays. Um, it, frustration, right? Um, it doesn't tell you what's connected to it. You've just got a bus and you better know ahead of time um, what it's going to be, and you have to code up support for it specifically. So, um, Graybus kind of fixes that. It, it essentially assumes a, a microcontroller on both sides of the loop. Um, you send, I put UART here, it really doesn't have to be UART, it just has to be some way that you can talk um, to the microcontroller. In fact, this microcontroller doesn't even necessarily have to be there um, on that side. Um, but you do need this microcontroller here on this side to break out the commands into the various um, transactions, I squared C, SPI, GPIO, PWM, A to D, um, that you'd have on a typical embedded system interface. When you use Graybus, you connect the device, you probe what it is, you have something now to answer you um, and tell you what's there. Um, you send back a manifest description, um, you know, could be, you know, anything, but you just need something to go and tell it, and there's a, um, a specification for Graybus manifests. Um, we've extended it a little bit to handle a whole combo a microbus description, um, and you load the driver and everything works. Um, native Graybus itself really just says, like, you can either have, like, the sensor that you're talking to, or you can just have a raw bus. Um, and there's more, that, but with, um, with the extensions for Microbus, it'll actually define what it is you're talking to and load the driver. So this is the, the software stack um, that um, you know, we built up to, to prototype this on. Um, this is not the way it's gonna end up. Um, so this is, uh, we've leveraged, so, so we have a, 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 a Beagle Play and a Beagle Connect Freedom. Um, so the Beagle Play is running a, a Linux, uh, is, is running Linux, um, and it has also a microcontroller on it um, to, to do the, the network transport. 
Um, but it takes Graybus and it introduces this thing called GB Netlink, which is you just use socket style interface to, to, to communicate with um, a service in the kernel. Um, so you can trap those um, Graybus accesses and move them up into a user space app where we can route network packets, right? That's the real reason it's there, right? So that we can um, do a Vahi-based discovery of devices and um, manage the security keys and all the things that you want to do that are a little bit hard to do um, in the kernel. Um, and it's a user space app. Um, this has to go, right? This is not skip. This is, this is prototype stuff, right? Um, but that's what we're doing today to get it all going, and then we're going back through a six low pan network over a sub gigahertz network. Um, we've got a, a an IEEE 154G Mac uh, interface over UART, um, and then a, um, a a radio interface to to send um, standard TCP/IP over, over six low pan on a sub gigahertz network, um, and that's what we've got running here. And then. Um, the, the, the sensor node um, running Zephyr and the Graybus for Zephyr application, which is also just available as a module if you want to plug it into other things um, to answer the, the, the Graybus requests, um, including providing the descriptors um, and then driving the, the bus transactions. Um, so to start the user space service, um, you, you run um, a shell script. It, pings and makes sure that something's actually alive and answering on the other side. Um, and then, um, oh, sorry. Um, and, and it loads up the, the gray bus service and now you're talking gray bus to devices. And it exposes the, um, I think I'm trying to merge too many things in this concept here with the, the, the Python stuff, right? Because my goal here was to take the I squared C dev interface that gets exposed um, you know, remove the the driver that we automatically load for the in the kernel for it, but and just get down to the 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 I two C dev. But you kind of quickly get into a lot of the problems, um, the quality problems again from not having something that's centrally maintained from experts that are actually trying to make products out of things. Right, um, you get stuff that just doesn't work and hasn't been touched in ages because um, it worked once and nobody's actually using it. So when you go to PyPy and you pull down the OPT3001 package in PyPy, it just doesn't work. Um, yeah, uh, I, I pulled down the, the, this, the, the examples that from how they had it, right? I had to, um, did I not include my little, um, yeah, anyway, it just doesn't work. Um, I did a little bit more searching because I wasn't quite happy with this. Um, and I found another one um, that wasn't in PyPy. Uh, it was just a, a, a standalone piece of Python code um, doing the, the I2C dev transaction. I had to patch it with a line of said because it didn't even provide the ability to specify which I squared C bus it was going on. Um, yeah, you know. Um, and once you do that, you run the little Python script. And being, I'm using I squared C dev uh, transactions over gray bus uh, to read it in an optical sensor. Woo! <laughs> Let's go the other way, to the other option. Or I could just use the existing Linux driver and with the, the manifest description um, that's on the, the microbus boards. It says what driver I need to load and which pins are what. Um, I can just utilize the Linux driver that's already there and use IEO info to provide me the output of the optical sensor. I appreciate that people like to write Python code. I don't know why. Um, so, I'm trying to, I, I'm overly snarky there because I, 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 I uh, really do want people to have a gateway to learning to program and moving things, but I, w I really think as a community we need to be thinking more about how we onboard these people and teach them about why having a single upstream, be it in Zephyr or be it in Linux, 
um, is really, really important. And having a device driver model means I'm getting shaped data. I just did IO info. I don't even know what kind of sensor. I don't care what kind of sensor it is. Right? It's just going to show up and it's going to tell me what type of sensor it is and it's going to tell me, it's going to put it in standard units that I can just use. Right? And then I can have all my Python stuff to go and grab that and put it up to the cloud. Right? Use your hacky Python stuff for that stuff, not the stuff that's actually talking to the device driver that when it doesn't work, your whole system just fails. Uh, it's, anyway. Yeah, this is a rant. Um, uh, um, presentation. Um, so uh, there's um, so so let's so that's that's Linux. Linux, you do the gray bus stuff, and you know the the stack is fairly complicated. It's not super stable today because it's relying on a user space driver. We're rewriting that, and we're putting the great the G bridge stuff into Zephyr as well. Um, and so when you come back in here. Um, the 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 gray bus will be the, the G bridge function will be in this microcontroller as opposed to in user space and it's going to manage the routing table and the automatic discovery and the addition of the devices um, and so this coding is in progress right so that um, um, we can have a nice stable um, you know G bridge interface somewhat akin to what you'd have in the like the Unipro hot plug approach. Um, but let's say um, this still to me is kind of rapid prototyping stuff, right? It, it, it's um, because the power for this, oh, okay, I thought I was getting a five minute warning, I had a one minute warning. Um, uh, this is not power effective, right? But it's really, really great to just see something is working right away. Um, kind of the right next thing to do is to do a Zephyr driver, right? So we see the sensor works, we know the hardware is great. Um, you know, we can just, um, I didn't show, I missed the, the paste for the, the, what the, the Zephyr driver interface looks like, where there's an OPT 3001 sensor in Zephyr. Since you guys program Zephyr, you know what it looks like. Um, and you can just use the Zephyr code to like, grab that and put it out um, on the same network. But instead of you relying on the gray bus thing to ask me for transactions, I just do something like broadcast UDP messages. And it's this many lines of Python to listen to those broadcast UDP messages and to get all my sensor data updates um, over, over UDP messages. So this is the, the, the easy way. Um, Graybus also has a sensor interface, right, so that you could potentially augment that to use to kind of keep the best of both worlds, right? The rapid prototyping, but then you just go and add the driver um, to, to, um, 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 to Zephyr and, um, and pass whole sensor messages um, so you can do all the sleep functions and all the timing things that you need. Um, to make a, a to, to make a real product, but now it's also super friendly, debuggable, and hackable as well. Um, yeah, um, uh, I don't know if do I have any time for questions, or am I got to get up, run, get up and run? All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I hope you do something with it. <laughs>